All right, welcome everyone. My name is Sarah Sims. We are pleased that you could all join us today for volume five of our 12 week no neuropsychology didactic series. This is our last lecture for this series. And we bring you lectures from experts in the field covering different topics each week. The series was created by trainees and early career neuropsychologists to provide free high quality didactic opportunities. We would like to thank our sponsors for their financial support for the series. Before we start, we want to make sure everyone is aware of our YouTube channel. Every No Neuropsychology and No Neuroanatomy lecture is available for your viewing pleasure. Be sure to check it out, subscribe, and like our lectures. Here are the disclaimers for this series. This training is not meant to replace formal education in neuropsychology, and the views of the speakers are their own. Questions can be submitted via the Q&A box on the lower left of your screen. And a recording of today's lecture will be provided on our website and YouTube channel later this week. It's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Ellison for today's lecture on Feedback 360, Culturally Competent Neuropsychological Feedback Across the Lifespan. Dr. Rachel Ellison is currently serving a three-year term as the chair for the Division 40 Women in Neuropsychology Committee. She is an assistant professor of psychology and associate DCT slash practicum coordinator at Illinois Institute of Technology. And in summer 2023, she will be transitioning to that same role at Roslyn Franklin University of Science and Medicine. She also works as a clinical neuropsychologist in private practice through Chicago Neuropsychology Group, conducting neuropsychological evaluations and cognitive rehabilitation. Her doctoral degree in clinical community psychology is from DePaul University and was focused on reducing systematic justice and, sorry, injustice and improving the lives of marginalized individuals and groups. Dr. Ellison completed her clinical internship through the UCSD and VA San Diego healthcare system and her postdoctoral fellowship in clinical neuropsychology through Edward Hines Junior VA Hospital. She was also engaged in postdoctoral research at Northwestern University through her fellowship. Dr. Ellison's current research merges her background and interest in social justice community psychology with neuropsychology through her socially conscious lab. Thank you so much for joining us today and thank you for presenting on feedback. You can go ahead and take it away. Great, thank you so much for having me here. All right, let's share screen and get started. Um, hello and thank you for having me here to discuss Feedback 360, Culturally Competent Neuropsychological Feedback Across the Lifespan. So for our roadmap today, I plan to discuss what is neuropsychological feedback and why is it important in the context of neuropsychological evaluations. We'll then discuss why in particular culturally competent feedback is important. After, we'll discuss when or should feedback truly begin. We'll discuss accessibility and format considerations for feedback sessions, the importance of intentionality about feedback order and structure, and questions to consider when providing feedback. We'll also discuss the importance of intentionality of your language during feedback and how your worldview may impact your language choices, as well as the importance of where you physically direct your uh, gaze and your, um, where you're looking during the conversation at feedback. Lastly, we'll wrap up to discuss how to maximize feedback effectiveness and making your message stick for patients and families. So we've got a lot to cover today. Of note, what we discussed today is based on my own training experiences and shaped by my own worldview. Um, outside of an initial discussion on why I feel culturally competent feedback is important, notably, I plan to integrate diversity and culture related issues really throughout the presentation, rather than having them separate from any of the components noted on our roadmap. This integration is intentional, as I believe working towards cultural humility as a clinician in all aspects of our patient care, including feedback, should be an integrated part of our practice and what we do, and not seen as an add-on. Before I really get it, dig in, let's review together, what is neuropsychological feedback? Feedback allows for the opportunity to directly provide results to our patients, and or their families or care teams, rather than the potential ambiguity of having patients or families interpret our reports on their own. Feedback allows us to educate patients and families about the test scores and any diagnoses, provide psychoeducation on important issues such as diagnoses, prognosis, etiology of cognitive concerns that may be unclear or misunderstood, 
to help our patients and their families understand prognoses for these diagnoses that we are providing and to provide resources and next steps. During the feedback process, through our conversation, we can help the patient and their family identify realistic next steps and help move the patient further along in their motivation for change across their various health concerns. Overall, for neuropsychologists, feedback is a great way for us as clinicians to flex a lot of our foundation therapy, foundational therapeutic skills. So now that we're on the same page about what is feedback, why is it so important? And it's important because we care about our patients. We want our patients and their families to understand the process they're engaged in, understand the diagnoses, understand what the next steps are. We're hoping not only to answer a question for the patient or for the referring provider, but really to make a difference in the patient's life for, um, that, for the work that we you know, and the patient put in a lot of work into this evaluation and to make this evaluation overall as useful as possible. We are not a computer spitting out test results. We want to be available to clarify misconceptions, to answer questions, and this should be truly a dynamic process. Importantly, this is also an ethical duty. And this ethical duty is specifically outlined in the ethical principles of psychologists and code of conduct under standard nine assessment, that we have a duty to take reasonable steps to explain our evaluation results to our patients. And so also more specifically, why is culturally competent feedback even important? Uh, but before we go there, I wanna briefly note about the difference between cultural competence versus cultural humility. Namely, by moving beyond cultural competence set forth by Sue and colleagues in 1992 and 1998, scholars have argued for abandoning the notion of multicultural competence in training those in healthcare or related fields, and rather using cultural humility as a better fitting goal in multicultural education. This critique emanates from the observation that cultural competence implies an endpoint an endpoint that counselors, physicians, psychologists, and others in healthcare or public service professions working with minority or culturally diverse populations can achieve. Rather, whereas uh, cultural humility frames the process as active and lifelong. The increased need for cultural humility or multicultural competence in neuropsychology um, is there even just based on some of the more recent changes in US demographics. As Dr. Rivera Mitt and colleagues opened with and astutely pointed out in their 2010 paper that quote, in the span of just over a hundred years, the US has shifted from a country into which one of eight residents was of ethnic minority status to a country in which approximately one in three residents is of ethnic minority status. Furthermore, in 2019, Pew Research statistics, uh, Pew Research reported statistics that nearly half of post-millennials, so six to 21 year olds, were non-white in 2018. Pew Research also reported that the U.S. Census Bureau projected that a majority of the U.S. population will be non-white by the year 2050. And there are significant implications for the shift as a field, for the construct validity of the tests themselves, for the norms that we use as neuropsychologists, and the growing disparity between the racial and ethnic identities of the neuropsychologists in practice and the patients that we treat. And although our field has more recently focused on cultural competence or cultural humility within our clinical interviews, taking a closer look at our norms, the validity of our tests, less focus has really been placed on cultural competence or cultural humility related to providing feedbacks post-evaluation. Of note, cultural humility or multicultural competence is not just about race or ethnicity. In clinical roles, it's really important to consider all aspects of both the patient and provider diversity and how these may interact with one another. Particularly important for feedback as well as for the clinical interview, where as neuropsychologists, we flex, as I noted, some of our foundational therapy skills. One model that can be really helpful for examining our intersecting identities for any clinician and how they may be similar or different to our patients is Hayes 2008 addressing model. So I highly recommend if you're not familiar with it, um, taking a look at that model in more detail. So we've discussed why feedback is important and the importance of culturally competent feedback sessions, but when does feedback actually begin? Is it only truly after the evaluation is done? 
So some providers may actually provide feedback maybe after the evaluation, but before the report is finalized as a, an early in-between. But I would argue for beginning the feedback process well before even then, and that there's inherent value with starting your feedback process during the initial clinical interview. Clinical interview is a time when you can build rapport, you can build trust, and this will not only help you during testing, but will also be extremely useful for the post-evaluation feedback session for buy-in on your diagnoses and any recommendations. The clinical interview is also an ideal time to start to understand um, areas that you may decide to bring up later as recommendations. And it's my belief that very few recommendations should blindside the patient post-evaluation during that feedback session. So during your clinical interview, I recommend to go so far as to specifically comment to patients if there are things you likely will include in your recommendations and making explicit note about them, um, as well as beginning to assess the patient's willingness towards change across these various recommendations. If there are specific resources you may include in your recommendations for them later, it can also be helpful to start to assess their openness to those resources and any potential barriers to access or to utilization of those resources that you may recommend. You can also start to consider um, cultural considerations related to any of the resources you may recommend that may be useful for your feedback process later. So the clinical interview or while you're in person right after testing, you know, kind of before the patient wraps up and leaves is also a really great time to begin any psychoeducation that may be helpful later during your feedback process. The feedback process I, can fi I find with patients can be really emotion filled and it can be packed with a lot of information for the patient and their family to digest. So starting any relevant psycho psychoeducation during, um, the, uh, during the, cl the clinical interview or earlier can really help the patient and their family so that they're not hearing these things for the first time during feedback. For many patients, I begin a conversation to provide psychoeducation about how their test results will be scored, how I'm going to be interpreting them right after the evaluation, right after they finish testing, before they head out for the day. So I usually um, tell patients that, you know, I like to explain to them and I, I do, you know, how both I'm assessing how they compare to um, similar norms, such as gender, education, but that also that I'm looking for patterns in their own data. I think it's important to explain to a patient what specific norms you will be using. And this is even more important, especially if particular norms may not be available. So maybe due to their advanced age, due to the patient identifying as transgender, maybe the patient has a lower uh, education level outside of typical minimum education-based norms. And explaining to the patient what this might mean for both your interpretation and their results. I believe in particular, it's important to have joint decision-making and informed discussions, particularly for which gender-based norms that you plan to use or may be most appropriate to use for transgender patients. And this is important both for you as a provider to have a better understanding of which norms may be most appropriate um, for a gender norm test. Um, if you're gonna be using both male and female scored results, as well as for the patient to understand how those results will be discussed and referenced in your feedback session and in the final report. In general, I also find it really useful to use any visual aids whenever possible. So for example, to show the bell curve to explain norms. And I'm gonna um, uh, you know, go over this in a little bit more detail later. Um, but I find the visual aids right after testing or during that clinical interview process to be even more helpful, especially if you can't be in person for feedback and using that opportunity while you are in person um, to use those great visual aids. Of notes for some providers, given their level of comfort um, and how much they're able to maybe score during the evaluation, maybe based on the specific referral question, they may also consider providing an abridged feedback session immediately after testing. So such as which diagnoses or etiologies they are more confidently concerned about or not concerned about at the time. As noted, this might not be appropriate for all providers. Uh, it might not be appropriate in specific training or supervisory contexts. Um, and for certain referrals or diagnoses, so especially if there's referral questions that require um, extensive collateral information that would truly help to confirm or disconfirm a diagnosis. 
Lastly, I think it's important during the clinical interview or the initial evaluation process, but before the um, feedback, to truly make sure the patient understands all the possible outcomes that may arise from the evaluation. And this can ultimately help for a much smoother feedback. So it's important to help their patient and their family manage expectations. Manage expectations of what information you'll be able to provide or won't be able to provide. And this may involve reframing the referral question, which at times may be pretty vague, um, as well as clarifying your role in the patient's medical care and the steps after the evaluation, what you will and you will not be involved in. It can also be helpful to lay the foundation for what may happen if their data is invalid. This may be particularly important with certain referral questions or in clinics with higher rates of invalid test results, but I think it's just a good practice to get into of uh, prepping your patients either after testing or during the clinical interview for this possible outcome and what it means for what information you as a provider can and cannot provide for them after the evaluation during your feedback. You can also start to initiate discussions of who can participate in their feedback, who they, who they might want to invite. This may impact coordination of the date and time of the actual feedback, um, or if they have the option with you, whether or not they choose to have the feedback in person or remotely, if they know others may or may not be allowed or able to participate. It's important to go over um, with, with our patients uh, how long they'll have to wait to receive feedback. And will they actually have the report accessible uh, to them at the time of feedback? Noting that in some larger medical session settings that patients may not have access to full report unless they request it through medical records. So there's no way that they could gain full access at the time of feedback, if, even if they wanted to. It's also helpful to clarify with patients um, in these kind of early stages what they should do if they haven't heard from you in a while. So if they're waiting on feedback or waiting to schedule feedback, and what do they do if they want to check in? Are they allowed to? Who do they call? What do they do? Some clinics or providers may routinely schedule feedback sessions automatically kind of a certain number of weeks out post-evaluation, but other clinics or providers may wait until the report is almost done uh, just prior to, uh, to scheduling. For my clinical practice, I tend to wait until the report is almost done just in case collateral information or other things takes a little bit while. Um, but I always encourage my patients that they are welcome to reach out to me if they haven't heard from me in about three weeks and they'd like to check in, that they are welcome to do so. This is also a great time to clarify, especially in forensic work or other work-related evaluations, if another entity, such as an employer, is actually considered the patient. Because this may impact whether or not and what type of feedback the patient that you're testing can actually receive at, during the feedback process. Lastly, it's really important to discuss and clarify what format the feedback session will be in. Is it going to be virtual? Is it going to be virtual just phone or virtual with video? Will it be in person? I typically like to do all my feedbacks virtually with video now these days, but however, some of your options may be determined by the clinic you're in or may be limited inherently by what insurance will cover, such as not being able to bill for a phone feedback and needing the, the video to be present as well. Regarding format, um, as previously noted, it's important to let the patients know if they have an option for others to attend, whether that is virtually, in person, or hybrid. Additionally, can you, with their permission, um, connect with other family or, or providers after their official scheduled feedback session? Are you allowed to or would be helpful to do maybe an abridged feedback, uh, feedback with um, a referring provider or with a caregiver or a parent or a spouse? Doing something like this and this type of um, a bridge shorter feedback with someone on their care team or their family afterwards can be really nice because it can allow the opportunity for one, the patient to hear the feedback first directly and then decide later who will receive the information. And two, for other parties to ask questions, to be involved in the feedback process in case they were unable to attend or they may not be able, they might not feel comfortable asking those questions directly in front of the patient. As providers, I think it's really important to consider when we have the flexibility, both the time and the financial costs, and not just for you, but for the patient, for in-person feedback. So the cost of transportation, needing to take off work. And although virtual and phone feedbacks have become increasingly more normative throughout the pandemic, it's important if you plan to conduct feedback virtually 
to really consider the pros and cons in particular with emailing or mailing the report in advance if you have the option to do so. Some benefits include the patient's ability to digest the information prior to the feedback session, come prepared with questions, potentially for better or for worse, alert you to any typos, and a pro or con may be that the patient may bring additional information to the feedback session based on the report that may actually change some of your impressions that you've been amending, that might have you amending or editing the final report. If you do decide to mail the report in advance versus email in advance, um, there's some things you also may consider that the patient may find helpful. This might be include pre-alerting the patient to the most relevant sections for their review rather than, you know, than just receiving this sometimes 12 to 15 page beast in the mail. And so this can be helpful, I find, uh, by folding the report kind of pre-open to the summary or recommendation section, as well as potentially highlighting headers for the summary recommendations, um, which I find patients really appreciate telling them, hey, it's gonna be folded right to the summary. I'm gonna highlight that, I'm gonna highlight the recommendations. You can of course read the full report, but draw your attention to those pieces. Those are gonna be the most important. If you're choosing to provide fully in-person feedback sessions, you may consider providing extra copies of the report so the patient can easily disseminate hard copies to additional providers on their care team without having to print, which may reduce an extra burden or cost without, with, for those patients without access to a printer. You can also consider giving um, a full extra copy of the report for the patient to take notes on directly during the feedback, um, just so they can follow along, highlight, um, you know, especially during your recommendations and make some extra notes for themselves. However, if you're in a clinic where you're unable to provide full copies of the report at the time of feedback, you may consider, if it's allowed by your clinic, providing a handout with a condensed version of just the recommendations um, and any diagnoses and some space to take notes during your discussion, just so your patients have something to walk away with and something as well as to take notes on. Of relevance, last year in 2021, Gruters and colleagues published a really nice scoping review of communicating neuropsychological test results to patients and family members. They found that overall neuropsychological feedback is usually given in person, and has been related to a positive effect on um, patient outcomes, such as an increase in the quality of life. I do wonder about the overall increase in virtual feedback sessions during the pandemic, and that this may not be fully captured by this scoping review. But either way, most papers that they reviewed reported on patient satisfaction, and they found that satisfaction with the neuropsychological assessment increased when useful feedback was provided. Interestingly, they also found that information retention was overall low, but communication aids such as any kind of written information were found to be really helpful in overall improving retention. Notably, additional help, uh, handouts are not only helpful for retention, but can also be very useful in situations where the patient's family, caregivers, parents, or the patient themselves speak a different language than the language that the final report is written in. So if you can't translate the full report, can you at least get a, a, you know, a handout translated with the summary, the diagnoses, the recommendations? Additionally, something to consider if the patient's parents, family, caregiver, caregiver, if they speak a different language than you do overall, how as a provider can you ensure that they are communicated results? How can you ensure that they also get their question as answered? In addition to deciding what format to use, it's really important to be intentional and just plan out the order or structure of how you would like to structure feedback sessions. All providers have a slightly different approach to how they structure feedback. Um, I'm gonna go over, this is my approach and what I found has worked really well with patients and their families. Of note, since I email my final reports in advance to our virtual feedback sessions, I start each feedback just checking in to make sure, hey, have you received the final report? Did you get it over email? Were you able to download it? Um, I let patients know I do have an outline for today, but I want to pause first and just give you the opportunity to ask any burning questions. Sometimes patients have them, sometimes they don't, but it gives them the space in case there's just something they're holding on before I get going. Then once they've gotten a chance to answer and ask any questions and I can answer, I give them an overview of the plan and structure for the feedback session. But I really start the feedback by reviewing the initial referral question. So who referred them, what their initial concerns were, what prompted the evaluation. And from there, I jump to the end. 
So I then provide any diagnoses or lack thereof. And I find this to be very helpful because a lot of patients are anxiously, anxiously waiting on this information and may not uh, adequately digest all the other things that you want to communicate to them until they get those pieces first. And so that's really important to get them that information. Next, I go over the patient's strengths and weaknesses, so their patterns on cognitive testing, making sure to summarize these, repeating them multiple times briefly after. And so I include both their normative strengths and weaknesses, as well as going over any relative strengths and weaknesses. Lastly, and how I describe most importantly, I walk through the recommendations. Um, I talk to the, uh, my patients describing it as, hey, this is a menu of options. Um, that these menu of options are there to discuss with your referring provider, with your care team. But I wanna go over this menu with you today to see which ones you wanna pick from, which ones might be useful for you now versus later. I make sure to explain to patients the holistic nature of at least the way I do my recommendations because some of the recs may not be as apparent to patients and family as to why they're relevant to the referral questions. They may be very obvious to you as a clinical neuropsychologist that this impacts brain health or mental health functioning and why you put it in the report, but making sure to, to make that link to patients and families when relevant. When relevant as well, I also draw attention to the fact that some recommendations may also be there to support families or caregivers, um, other people as part of the patient's care care team, and that not all of them, when it's relevant, might be directly focused on the patient, but may have more of an indirect effect. I always make sure to go over um, recommendations to review, at the, um, to review at the end, and then summarizing the major takeaways from cognitive testing, any diagnoses, any other major points I really want them to walk away with, such as major contributing etiologies for cognitive concerns. I then finish my feedback sessions always with a discussion of, well, what's next? What are the next steps for them? What do they need to consider? And so some of this might include addressing what do they do if they have questions when the session's over? I always let them know they can always reach back out if they have additional questions. Um, what if their referring provider or their care team have questions? What should they do? Uh, what if their family or friends or spouse have questions? I explained to them how this evaluation can be useful for them in the future. So the idea that, you know, especially if this is their first neuropsych evaluation, now uh, myself or another neuropsychologist can compare you to you versus just you to a normative population and how this can be helpful for them. Um, explaining whether you as the provider will be communicating directly with their referring provider or is it going into a chart or are they communicating? who is responsible and clarifying who is responsible for giving the referring provider the report. In my practice, because I'm in private practice, I always let the patient know it's their responsibility to disseminate any copies of the report, whether it is to the referring provider or any, anyone else they would like to give the report to. Um, the plan for disseminating copies of the report, again, to additional parties, who's gonna do that? Um, and then when is it appropriate for them to seek a reevaluation? When should they come back, if at all? Lastly, I really find it's important to pause and allow one final opportunity before you wrap up, just opening that door again for questions. Um, but also, if it's relevant to your practice, to remind them that they can always reach back out for additional questions. And I find this can be really helpful so patients don't feel so overwhelmed to make sure they kind of get out everything and anything in that moment and that they have that safeguard of knowing, whew, I can digest the information that's been provided and then it's okay, I can reach back out if I need something clarified or you know, if there's something I will need to discuss later. I rarely find that patients end up reaching back out, but a lot of patients I, I find express feeling pretty relieved knowing at least there's an option should they need it. In addition, no matter how you structure a feedback session, it may be helpful to walk through these types of questions, which may impact how you modify your structure, what types of information you present, and how you present it. So these types of questions may include, what are the main points I'm trying to get across with this particular report, with this particular evaluation, with this particular diagnosis? How can I make these points really more digestible for the patient, family, caregivers, while still being very direct with them and clear? Is there anything that might interfere with the patient actually digesting or understanding what I'm trying to say? Or are there any barriers to the patient's family or their care team, either logistically 
uh, receiving or digesting the feedback, so language barriers, logistical barriers. And something to think about, is there anything that as a provider, I'm personally anxious about communicating and I need to reflect on in advance or take a little bit more time and prepare for? It's also important during the feedback session to be extremely intentional and mindful about the specific language choices that you use. I find it's really helpful to use exact wording, phrases, examples from the patient's clinical interview to help explain what you're trying to get across with the results. So for example, to a patient, you know, you described feeling to me like it takes you twice as long as your peers in class to complete your assignments, to get your readings done, um, to get those take-home tests done. And you know what? I saw those same types of difficulties that you were describing to me with how fast you were able to work without making mistakes on the testing you did. I was able to see that exact thing that you were talking about. I think it's important to, um, during feedback to be mindful of any neuropsych jargon um, and avoiding that whenever possible, but really being intentional, do not shy away from, uh, from providing specific diagnoses. So relatedly, I had the unfortunate experience of previously working with a patient who was never communicated that they had a more significant and stigmatizing medical diagnosis. And this diagnosis was ultimately now impacting their cognitive functioning. And I think that really does a disservice to our patients when we're not very clear and direct with the diagnoses they are receiving. In general though, I truly think it's okay to, to have PR and have spin and, and plan and think about how you plan to frame things, how you plan to present the information, all that matters. So for example, if you have an invalid test results, um, so a case of mild TBI or concussion, you know, you might indicate to the patient, you know, there's nothing I can do about your concussion, your history of it, history of head injury, but look, there are all these other modifiable factors, sleep, pain, mood that were impacting testing. And these are these things are actually great because these things are things that we can change, that we can improve. And if we do, these might be able to improve some of the concerns that you're having. So frame spin can, can really help um, for how your feedback is received. Additionally, it's not only important to make sure that to use whatever the correct salutation, pronoun verbally during your feedback session, but also triple check your reports for these types of errors. Um, this can actually translate to a smoother feedback session. Specifically, pronouns, names, birth dates, do control find, look through your report, print them out, read them, highlight. These types of errors are not just annoying, but they can truly detract from the credibility of your report and any buy-in during your feedback session, both from the patients as well as um, their care team. You really want patients and their families, their caregivers, their care team engaged in the important aspects of feedback, the diagnoses, the etiologies, the recommendations, and you don't want them focused on finding and calling out little typos and errors um, throughout your feedback session. I find it also helpful to try to avoid any potentially seemingly accusatory language with recommendations such as you really shouldn't be smoking or you really need to be working out more. Again, this comes down to framing. This comes down to using our skills as psychologists where we can utilize empirically validated principles from things like motivational interviewing, using SMART goals. Specifically with patients, think about what is that first small step towards positive behavior change? What's realistic and feasible for this patient? You can even discuss the, hey, the long-term goals for you to stop smoking but would you be open to cutting down? What would that look like for you? What do they think is the next step that they can easily accomplish? To help increase motivation and in directing the conversation towards positive change, I find it really helpful to connect the recommendations, especially the ones that are related more indirectly to their referral question, by connecting them back to the patient's reason for referral, if relevant, and their express goals. So their you know, concerns for cognitive functioning is a lot of time why people are, are brought in. For example, instead of saying you should, framing language such as, you know, you expressed a concern with your memory. What are your thoughts on reducing your overall alcohol consumption, given the impact that this may be having on your memory, as well as your nighttime, nighttime sleep, which you talked about is not really great right now. In general, I find it beneficial to also provide positive praise for wherever the patient is in their process towards change. 
um, on it, uh, in the recommendation. So quoting words from their clinical interview wherever possible, such as, you know, I'm completely in support of your efforts to reduce your overall smoking. It's really great that you've already cut down from two packs to one pack per day. You know, that's really awesome. And, and I really support that. I know you express a concern with your memory, you express a concern with your thinking, and this is a great way to work towards also protecting your vascular system and protecting your brain health. As we know, all those blood vessels in the body go up to the brain, and you're really making some good steps here towards contributing to protect um, your brain health for the future too. What do you think is a good next step for you to help with your goals here? So again, using that language, pulling in their initial goals, praising them for where they're at in the process. Lastly, in general, I find sometimes patients may become overwhelmed with a huge list of recommendations at the end of the report and going through them one by one during the feedback session. And so I find the language of framing the recommendations as I previously noted as a menu of options and that this menu of options they can discuss with their care team, maybe picking some now, later and so on, that can help reduce some of the stress and the burden of the overall you know, large list of recommendations that are being thrown at them. As a reminder for SMART goals, this means taking any goals and making them specific, making them measurable, actionable, realistic, and time-bound. For example, changing a patient's goal to improve their health to something like, I'm going to start walking two to three days a week in the morning for 15 to 20 minutes starting next week. The idea that improving health is really vague, can't really measure it. And, you know, I don't really know what improving health means. That may encompass many different things for many different people. So using a SMART goal framework can really help to give patients a realistic next step and uh, make it a, a lot less daunting. I like to use the analogy of stair steps with patients when discussing SMART goals and the idea of that next step is too high. We're not going to be able to get to the top. We're not going to be able to climb to the top of that staircase, whatever the ultimate goal is. Our goal in creating the SMART goal, whatever that step is, is to create a small enough step that truly is focused on helping with routine change and gradual behavior change. And so this step should be something that you are likely to succeed and get you moving in the right direction. And that can be, again, a lot less daunting for a patient the idea that this is about making a routine change and not about trying to, in a short period of time, get to that ultimate end goal. When thinking about language, it's also really important to consider how your own worldview, your own values that you come into the clinical practice with may impact how you say, what you say, particularly related to recommendations during a feedback session. So think about the goals and the recs that you're given. Um, you're given, you know, um, how many are your personal goals? What do you think the patient's goals are? This may be particularly relevant when considering um, recommendations around return to school and work-related goals around transition periods, um, just kind of checking how your own values and making sure you're not imposing those on the patient. The order in which you present both your written report recommendations, as well as what you present orally and which recommendations you devote more time to during feedback can also shed some additional light on your values in addition to what language you're using beyond which may be objectively most clinically relevant to the patient. With specific feedback sessions, it's also um, extremely important to self-reflect on any emotional reactions that you have, may have to communicating various diagnoses, as we kind of alluded to before. Specifically, take time every so often to check in to see, have you become really desensitized to certain diagnoses, given the frequency you may see that, that type of presentation or that type of diagnosis? diagnosis, or the frequency that you see may be more functionally debilitating diagnoses. For students or trainees, this is also important to check your, emotion, uh, your emotional comfort with communicating more debilitating or functionally impairing diagnoses when you're giving those for the first time. And again, making sure not to kind of talk around the diagnostic labels and be very clear and direct with those still to the patient. Lastly, during the feedback session itself, check in with yourself. What assumptions, if any, are you making based on the patient's level of emotional responsiveness to what information you're giving, based on their eye contact or their engagement in the feedback session? And is that impacting how you're interacting during the feedback session as well? However, it's not just about what you say. It's also about how you say it. 
um, and your nonverbal, so who you're turned to during the evaluation, who you're making direct eye contact with during the feedback. I feel it's really important to when you have others in the room, when you have caregivers, a parent, speak to the patient if they are present in the room, not about the patient. Consider if you can't do that, having multiple feedback sessions. So a secondary, more extensive feedback with a parent or a caregiver, if that's appropriate. And always make sure, you know, I'm sure you would have done this in the clinical interview, but during the feedback session, re-ask the patient for permission to speak directly or communicate information directly to anyone else that's present, a caregiver, a guardian, a spouse, a parent, and making sure to get their explicit permission to tell those things specifically not to the patient and to the other person in the room. I find that to be very respectful and helpful. If you're over the phone or telehealth, confirm that the patient as well as others, making sure specifically though, can the patient hear you um, if you have multiple people kind of calling in with them, that that's really important too. All right, so we're gonna take a little bit of a transition now. And so I wanna talk and start to wrap up for how else do we make our feedback sessions or our communication with patients and families more effective? How do we ensure that patients and families, their caregivers, how they truly hear and digest all this good stuff that we're trying to tell them. How do they retain the information and how do we help ensure that? So I find using some of the best practices from uh, learning strategies to be really helpful. So specifically, we can um, try to create lists or organize our findings, trying to chunk our findings down into three main things we wanna get across. What are the three big takeaways that we wanted them to get from their testing data? What, if anything, if they only walk away with two to three things, do you want the patient, their family to walk away with? This will be the focus on what you review, 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 what you go over again and again, repeat and summarize throughout their evaluation, especially those key takeaways. In general, repetition is crucial. Um, this is also why beginning the feedback during the clinical interview can be really helpful because then they're not hearing things for the first time um, completely new. Some stuff will be completely new during that post-evaluation feedback, but other things such as some of your recommendations, maybe some psychoeducation about norms, they've heard more than once, which can reduce the amount that they have to digest during that feedback session. In addition, be mindful of your pacing, the speed of information delivery. I tend to talk really, really fast. Um, and so I always have to remember to slow down, allow natural pauses, allow your patient and family not only a chance to digest in information, but also to process, to interject, to ask questions, to feel like there's a natural place to do so. Lastly, you know, allowing the patient or anyone else present at feedback session to be able to ask those types of questions, to be able to discuss if need be, to take notes. All these things can help with improved encoding of information. Remembering what we know about these best practices and learning, being able to engage with the material, repeat it back to someone, summarize it yourself, really helps with encoding and retention of information. So give that chance to your patients and their families. Visual aids, as we noted before, can also really help aid in understanding. Um, you can also suggest some ex external learning and memory tools for your patient. Um, so this may or may not include um, allowing the patient to record the sessions, if you're comfortable with that, not everyone is or not everyone will be able to, uh, providing a handout for them to take notes, or even allowing a friend or family member to even just call into the session to be that extra set of eyes and ears, not always to engage in the session, but just to help uh, retain some of that information so that the patient can be present and know that someone else is digesting that information too for them for afterwards. You can consider at the very end of your feedback, asking the patient, what are you walking away with? What did you understand? What's your takeaway? What are the main points that, that you got from what we talked about today? So this does a few really nice things. So this can um, help with the patient's encoding for them to summarize themselves from what we know about learning theory. It can also allow for a chance for you to clarify any misunderstandings. And so to correct that, oh, actually I said this, or you know, yes, you said A, B, and C, but I also said D, and that's really important to, to walk away with as well. In the training context, this is also a great opportunity for students and trainees to be able to see also how much of what they're communicating is sticking with the patient during feedback to help improve their feedback skills. 
Overall, make sure to listen and observe your patient and the other family members or caregivers during that feedback session. Do not just go on autopilot, just going through your checklist and disseminating information. Be sure to watch your patients and their families' nonverbal emotional reactions and check in. It's okay to pause. It's okay to process where they are at different pieces. Check in if they're feeling overwhelmed. Um, to acknowledge the process components of what you're seeing, what you're feeling in the room. Again, feedback should be engaging. It should be a dynamic process, and you're not just talking at those in attendance. I also find that using analogies whenever possible can help further make your message stick. So there's so many analogies that are out there. Gather from colleagues, from supervisors, um, but some examples that have worked really well for me include, for some reason, cars are great analogies in, in cognitive testing and feedback sessions. So I, I, I talk a lot about car cylinders. You only have so many cylinders in the brain and using this to discuss about diversion of resources, such as if you've got four cylinders and one is dealing with pain, one is dealing with depressive symptoms, one is dealing with dysregulated sleep, you only have that one cylinder left for whatever resources that you need. I also find the analogy of a wet blanket on the brain or, uh, you know, that the idea that, you know, uh, that the brain itself is functioning well, but, you know, if someone was failing a performance validity uh, test and the testing is invalid, um, that I can't see what's going on because there's this wet blanket on top. Everything else might be intact, but the wet blanket is, is hindering the performance. Similarly, um, describing to the patient, you know, kind of like they're moving in an MRI machine that I can't clearly see what's going on. And that was what happened during testing for invalid uh, testing results. City analogies can also be great for describing the brain. So white matter for roads and other transportation, gray matter for buildings. Um, there are so many good analogies out there, but I think it helps make it more digestible. It also helps make the information unique and help it stick. And so thinking about our learning and memory strategies. I also find it really helpful to connect any test result to strengths and weaknesses, what this means to the real world, to what this means functionally, to what this means day to day for the patient. Um, is the patient described things during the clinical interview, discussing those strengths and weaknesses back to the specific instances or examples that they actually use during the clinical interview? Lastly, as previously noted, you know, using visuals whenever possible, I think can really help. And so to help with people getting um, information in auditorily, but also visually to supplement, everyone's got a different learning style, but um, capitalizing on more than one modality, I think can be really, really helpful. One visual that I find really useful is just a really stripped down version of the bell curve. So not with all the Z scores and T scores and percentages underneath, just a really basic image like this um, when providing psychoeducation on normative samples on how I'm going to be evaluating their data. So whether you do this at the very end of testing or beginning of testing, or wait until the actual scheduled feedback session afterwards, I think giving patients, as I noted previously, a really basic overview on how we use normative data sets is helpful and that visuals can make all the difference in the world for explaining this. So what I describe to patients is that, hey, if I'm gonna put you in a room with 99 other people, I would expect for your attention, your memory, your other cognitive abilities, most of your scores to fall kind of here in this middle. About 25 people do better than you and maybe about 25 people you to do better than. Um, and that's normal for your attention, memory, everything to kind of fall in here. That's what I would expect. What I'm looking for in part is when most people in a room are, you know, is when you're doing better than most people in the room. So you're kind of falling over here where I put you in a room and nine other people and you're doing better than most in attention. That's helpful information for me. It's also really helpful for me to know if more, most people in the room are doing better than you if you're falling over here. I also describe to patients that, hey, even if you're falling in this average range, in this middle part where I expect you to be, I'm also looking for patterns within your own scores. Um, so big splits across your scores, that's also helpful data. And we're pulling together all of this data, both the normative data, how you did on testing, your clinical interview, how you're um, you know, responding on different um, uh, self-report evaluations, uh, information that I'm getting from collateral sources, such as a parent, a caregiver, a spouse, all of that I'm pulling together um, to help answer the referral question and provide you with recommendations. 
going back to our, our three main points, um, you know, that simplicity, keeping the session organized, keeping it structured, and eye on those three main takeaways and those points you want to get across. So that simplicity and structure can be really helpful for making your message stick. The last thing that we sometimes forget about um, is the power of credibility in helping your messaging during feedback stick. So it can be really helpful to make sure you know any research supporting whatever you might be recommending or any diagnoses. Know your data and cite trusted sources when relevant. You should be prepared going into a feedback session to defend your stance, whether that's a diagnosis or, or a lack thereof, and to know alternative viewpoints and topics that may have a lot of misinformation, particularly in the media or conflicting information out there that the patient might be digging into. Lastly, we kind of forget about this as well, is that you know having any credentials visually displayed during a feedback session you know, not to say it's going to do a ton, but, you know, it might help serve as a reminder, literally in the background of the credibility of what you're saying. It can't hurt. All right, so we've discussed a lot, but there's always more to learn about feedbacks. So if you're interested in learning more about providing feedback, I highly encourage you to explore some of these resources. This is not an all-inclusive list. So go ahead, uh, watch uh, Dr. Amanda Gooding's previous No Neuropsychology talk on providing feedback to patients and families. Check that out. Karen, Dr. Karen Polsel did a really great two-part uh, recorded series with NAB Neuro, um, and she's got a great book if you haven't read, Feedback That Sticks. Those are other wonderful resources. There are also some great articles to read on the topic, such as the Gruder's 2020 scoping review that we discussed earlier. And uh, Dr. Rivera Mint and colleagues in 2010 also published um, a really nice article entitled Increasing Culturally Competent Neuropsychological Services for Minority Populations, A Call to Action. They included a number of really nice resources at the end if you're interested in furthering your own cultural humility. Um, there's so many other great resources to, that exist, but this is a really great start. Um, and lastly, I, I wanna do a shout, shout out to Dr. Aran, Arani's recently published Cultural Diversity and Neuropsychological Assessment, and Dr. Fuji's 2017, Conducting a Culturally Informed Neuropsychological Evaluation. All right, so to wrap up, just like all aspects of clinical care, consider giving feedback an evolving process that you are constantly tweaking, improving, and growing in your cultural humility to be a better clinician across a variety of intersecting identities that you have. So just like some of the um, you know, resources that I highlighted previously, there are tons of great resources that exist to learn more about providing feedback. Um, but really, any opportunities to shadow supervisors, shadow your colleagues, um, that's a great idea to help you improve your feedback skills and gain your own menu of options for best practices really to add to your own toolbox. Students can also work to increase the amount of feedback you provide during joint feedback sessions with supervisors. So if you're a trained student or trainee and you're doing joint feedback sessions, add on a little bit more that you will provide each time to really help increase your skills. And you know, one nice benefit from the ongoing pandemic is the increased normativity, normativity with telehealth for feedback. And this really provides a nice increased opportunity for students and trainees to either observe feedbacks or have supervisors or colleagues observe them and provide feedback on your own feedback skills. Gaining additional exposure or consultation on your recommendations and your, the way you write your recommendations can also help translate to improve feedback sessions through increasing your menu of options for what you think about uh, recommending, how you talk about those recommendations, um, both in writing and ver uh, verbally. But overall, Please give yourself some leniency. Feedbacks are hard, no matter how much training you have or where you are in your career. And no matter how great a clinician you may be, not all feedbacks will go well, and that's okay, and that happens. Some feedbacks are just harder than others, and you're gonna get different emotional responses and reactions from different feedbacks and diagnoses, and that's gonna happen across training levels and across your career. Um, so be prepared for that and give yourself a little bit of leniency when and if that does happen. All right, so again, thank you for having me today to discuss culturally competent feedback. I'm happy to now open it up to any questions and discussions at this time.
Great, thank you so much. And um, if anyone has a question, please type it into the Q&A box and submit it there, and then I will pose it to Dr. Ellison. So um, I have a first question. I was just thinking about pacing. Um, that's something that I think is hard to get a handle on. Um, you know, how much time do you spend in each part of the feedback? Um, how long are your feedbacks usually? Or what is kind of like the guidelines that you try to stick to? Yeah, so I usually tell patients when I'm scheduling feedback, I say, hey, we're going to schedule an hour because, you know, I want to make sure we have that time if we need it. But it typically takes about 20 to 30 minutes, and that is typical, but there's more time available if you need it. So I give them the expectation that it's typically about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, but extending to the hour. Now, this doesn't include going back to a referring provider, or if you're kind of doing those add-on feedbacks, those are separate. Those usually are about five or six minutes. And honestly, sometimes those don't happen at all because when I'm getting collateral information, if I've got a consent for both ways at that point, I'm already giving feedback as I'm gathering collateral information. Hey, these are my initial impressions. Here, this is what I'm thinking. What are things you want to recommend to make sure we're on the same page? And so a lot of times those additional feedbacks I find with um, the patient's care team are not necessarily needed after because we've already had those discussions before. Just as we talked about that feedback process happens even with collateral um, a lot of times. Now that's not the case if people sign only a one way, say for a parent, you know, parents can tell you, but you can't tell them. Uh, but yeah, really about 20 to 30 minutes. Um, I think I, I try to spend about half the time in recommendations. I think the recommendations are the meat of it. Um, I think it's really important to give yourself enough time also to repeat and to summarize and to give pacing there. Um, so there's no right or wrong way. And you kind of get into your own flow and figure out what works well for you. And that's where I think having a structure. So you kind of know where the roadmap and you know when you need to speed up or you know when you need to slow down or, hey, we'll come back to this. We're going to be getting there. Um, and so I think those different things can kind of help keep it contained and within the allotted time that you need. Yeah, that's great. And we have a question from the audience. So if this person is in a setting where feedback is not provided directly, what can they do the day or add on for the day of the evaluation to better prepare the patients and possibly you know, patient caregivers or things like that for the report they and their doctors will receive later? Yeah, and I think that goes back to what we talked about expectations. So I think that's really important early on and in the consent process that it's very clearly outlined that there is no feedback and then reminding them at the end of the evaluation, hey, as a reminder, here are the next steps. You're receiving a report. And then I think it's even more important to build in as much psychoeducation as possible during the actual evaluation itself, because you're not giving that. So talking about norms, talking about how it's evaluation, evaluated, talking about the structure of the report. All right, you're going to see it's going to have basic demographic information, referral question. It's going to go over all of your history. You can read through all that, but that's just a lot of the background and it'd be a nice um, you know, summary of you for your next providers. Now it's all in one place, but really the meat of it is where you wanna flip is that summary and recommendation section. And that's where it's gonna give you a lot of that information. So I think providing also psychoeducation about what's in the report, the structure, um, and a lot of that kind of prep work can be done even if you're not telling them at that time or ever directly what their diagnoses are, what the strengths or weaknesses, just telling them, hey, there's going to be a summary of your strengths and weaknesses. There will be somewhere that says if there is a diagnosis. Sometimes I like to even go so far to tell patients, well, what could be a cognitive diagnosis? What are the range of diagnoses that could come out of this? You know, mild neurocognitive disorder, major, which means dementia. What's the difference between the two? Um, you know, what are other types of diagnoses like neurodevelopmental diagnoses? Those are also types of cognitive diagnoses. You may see psychiatric diagnoses. Sometimes we don't fully evaluate, but sometimes those are pulled from history. Those are also included. We don't include medical diagnoses, um, but they may be noted as etiologies, you know, and, and then explaining what's in the recommendations and why they're there. So again, a lot of that psychoeducation can be provided, even if you, in a research context, don't have the opportunity to give them what their specific diagnosis is. You probably, based on the research sample, have a range of options that are coming out or a template for the report of what it's looking like. And you can go over that process of, uh, with them at that time. Well, I'll try to squeeze in this last question. Real sure. Quick. 
Um, so this person says, most of my diverse clients and family show no more interest in tests, norms, and comparisons to others than they do in understanding how a CT scanner works. They uh, want to know what they're dealing with and how to deal with it, so more practical kind of things. Do you consider it reasonable to not talk about tests and feedback? I think it's totally reasonable. So I think it's, you know, hearing your patient and hearing what they want. And again, it's a dynamic process. So I have some patients on the opposite end who are psychiatrists or prescribing providers. And so they want to know all the details. And so you give them more information because it's helpful for them. It's relevant and it also builds rapport, um, you know, and so you can always let the patient know um, and start with all the other stuff and let them know, hey, if you ever, if you come back and you ever want to have a further discussion about the norms or how this is, you can always come back, let me know. But as you express, like you're more interested in this. So we're going to focus here, but we can always go back to that in the future if that's something you're interested in. Or if after you go home, you digest a report and there are questions about this, know the door is always open and you can reach back out. So I think it is totally fine to be patient directed. There's some things I wouldn't skip over like diagnoses, um, yeah. but other things I think are totally fine to skip over if the patient is explicitly and verbally expressing that they don't want to go there. Um, and you know, just letting them know that door is open if they do want to go there, that you can provide that information to them is helpful. Yeah, that's a that's a great point. You know, maybe too much too soon for some information where they want to really get different information right then, right there. So but thank you so much um, for talking to us about feedback and we really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for joining us for our final lecture in this series. We'll be starting up our summer no neuroanatomy series, July 11th. So be on the lookout for emails about that schedule. Um, you can also look on Twitter and we'll be posting information about that. So thank you so much and have a good rest of your day, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Yeah. Ellison. <laughs> Take care. Bye.